Hi everyone, welcome back to the History in 20 podcast where today we are going through part two of the top ten Roman emperors. Hope you enjoy it, see you on the other side. At number five we have Emperor Aurelian. Born 9th of September 214, died October 275. His reign was from May 270 to October 275. Aurelian came to the throne just before the third century crisis truly erupted, and yet his reign was far from crisis. He reunited the empire and earned his self-adopted title a restitutor orbis, or restorer of the world. After serving in the Roman army for decades, upon his ascension, Aurelian quickly set about restoring Roman authority in Europe. He turned back the Vandals from Pannonia, and after a series of battles expelled the Alemanni, then the Jathungi from northern Italy, to right across the Danube. He ordered the construction of a new city wall around Rome, much of which is still sta- much of which still stands today. The wall is actually named after him, known as the Aurelian Wall. In 271, he sought to recover the eastern provinces which had obeyed the rule of Palmyra. He besieged Palmyra, and shortly afterwards, the capital surrendered. When Palmyra revolted a second time in 273, Aurelian recaptured and razed the city. In 274, he returned west to confront Tetricus, the rival emperor in Gaul, who uh, had sway over both Gaul and Spain and also Britain. After the, after defeat at the Battle of Chalon, Aurelian made the momentous decision to withdraw Roman troops from Dacia, modern-day Romania, and resettle soldiers and settlers south of the Danube in uh, Macedonia, the Balkans region, yeah, that in the modern day. He understood that defensible boundaries were essential for the long-term survival of the empire, and therefore used the natural borders of the of rivers like the Danube and the Rhine to uh, form his form the empire's defences. Early in 275, while marching to open air campaign against Persia, Aure- Aurelian was murdered by a group of officers who had led who had allegedly been misled by his secretary into believing themselves marked for execution. The empire remained divided and chaotic until Diocletian's ascension in 284, who later sort of gave the empire a good kicking and got it back into order. Aurelian deserves a place in this list just simply for the fact that upon his death a crisis erupted. He defeated so many enemies of Rome and so many enemies within that he had basically rebound the emperor from what's empire from what seemed like an almost foregone conclusion of its death and kept it on life support for uh, centuries to come. It's um, it's insane to think of the alternate histories we could have if Aurelian hadn't been murdered by his officers because he, he was seen to be co- as competent, if not more so, than Trajan. He was just a f- fantastic emperor, but obviously he didn't have the... Uh, the time to uh, to give us it. His name survives to modern day, uh, named with, with uh, French cities named after him, like uh, obviously Orleans, Orléans was named after him, and uh, yeah, that's uh, why I deserved a place on this list. Fantastic emperor. So at number four we have Constantine the first, but he's better known as Constantine the Great, and he was born on the twenty seventh of February, circa two seventy two AD and died on the 22nd of May, 337, and he was aged about 65. And he reigned from the 25th of July, 306, up to the 22nd of May, 337, which is 30 years and 10 months. So obviously that's a lot of stuff to cover, so we're only going over him very briefly, but I highly recommend looking into Constantine, because he is one of the all-time great emperors, which is exactly why he's got a place on this list. So start off basically he had he was an incredibly good military general um, when he was on campaign against the barbarians and the persians and then the britons this was all before he became emperor and you might recognize as you'll see on your screen now the cairo which are christ's initials and they were painted on constantine's army's shields now why did he do this well this is just before he becomes emperor so at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which was part of a series of civil wars in Rome, this was on the 28th of October, 312, Constantine had a vision of God the night before the battle, and he was told, 
in this sign conquer and so he had his army painted on the shields and then they subsequently went and won the war and Constantine became emperor but why is this significant why are we all of a sudden talking about God when all these other Romans have had pagan gods before the Roman gods well Constantine was the first Christian emperor which we'll see is a massive thing that survives for centuries to come with other subsequent Christian emperors but he was the first one and he obviously had such an impact that it survived this long so where was he acclaimed emperor well a local one for where we're from close enough anyway he was at a place called Eboracum which you might know better today as York and he actually has a statue there outside York Minster today which you can still see and visit and it's I highly recommend it I'll put a picture up on your screen so you can see it there so why was he so good well he restructured the government because he set and by doing so he separated the civil and military authorities which was a huge thing and it's something that still happened way further on in the empire as well Obviously, he was a good military man, as I mentioned earlier, and he completed successful campaigns on the Roman frontiers against the Franks, the Alemanni, the Goths, the Samaritans, and he even resettled territories by his predecessors during the third century, well, that were lost during the third century crisis. Economically, he was successful as well, so he combated inflation by introducing a new gold coin called the Solidus, which became the standard for the Byzantine and European currencies for over a thousand years. He was the, like I mentioned earlier, the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity and he was supremely influential in the Edict of Milan in 313 AD which declared tolerance for Christianity within the Roman Empire. He also convoked the first Council of Nicaea in 325 which produced the Statement of Christian Belief called the Nicene Creed and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem was built under his instructions at the alleged site of Jesus Christ's tomb and this is where you can still visit it today and hundreds of thousands of people visit it every year and this was commissioned by Constantine and he also built a new imperial residence at Byzantium called Constantinople after himself which subsequently became the capital of the Eastern Empire for more than a thousand years and he also replaced Emperor Diocletian's Tetrarchy with the de facto principle of dynastic succession and I don't think there needs to be any explanation as to why he deserves a place in this list one of the all-time great emperors I mean economically and even religiously he converted the empire which would last not just for a hundred years not for 200 years not for 300 but for over a thousand years and his legacy still survives today at number three we have the emperor claudius now we're going back a bit further in time here because he was born on the 1st of august 10 bc and he died on the 13th of october 54 ad aged 63 and he reigned from the 24th of January 41 to the 13th of October 54, so about 13 years. So, why is Claudius on this list? Well, he was the first Roman emperor, fully full emperor, to be born outside of Italy. He was born at Lugdunum, sorry for the pronunciation, in Roman Gaul, which is in modern-day Lyon in France. He was notable for a number of reasons, and partly because his was a rule of somewhat stability between two of the most unstable emperors, Caligula, who we mentioned last week, and Nero. So, another feature of Claudius's, which emphasised how good he was, was that despite all of his achievements, he was deaf and afflicted with a limp, or semi-deaf, anyway, partly deaf, which led to him to be ostracised by his family from a young age, but he still made it as an emperor. Now, after Emperor Gaius's murder on the 24th of January 41, the Praetorian Guards, which were the imperial household troops, made Claudius emperor. So, despite a rocky start to his reign, including attempts on his life from various members of the Senate, Claudius was ruthless in his dealings with them, and it didn't take long for people to respect him or face the consequences. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, from the very beginning, he emphasised his friendship with the army, and he paid cash for his proclamation as emperor. In 43 AD, Claudius invaded Britain, becoming the first emperor to successfully do so, as well as cross the River Thames and capture the city of Camaldunum, which is modern-day Colchester, which eventually became the Roman capital of Britain. Now, Claudius was also concerned with expanding the Roman frontiers in Gaul because he was concerned with the anti-Roman Druid priesthood. 
But elsewhere in the empire, he annexed Mauritania between 41 and 42 in North Africa. That's sort of modern-day Morocco today. Lycia in Asia Minor in 43 and Thrace in 46, which is now covers an area of modern-day Greece, Bulgaria and Turkey. He then annexed northeastern Palestine to the province of Syria in 49 AD. However, he was conscious not to involve the empire in major wars with the Germans and the Parthians. So he'd seen the impact this had had before. So, at home, Claudius' policies were enlightened for his time, so he improved the judicial system and he approved a moderate extension of Roman citizenship by individual and collective grants. In Noricum, which is south of the Danube in what is now sort of Austria and Bavaria, five communities there became Roman principalities. And he also encouraged urbanisation and developed several colonies, most notably at Colchester and Colonia, which is modern day Cologne in 51 AD. Now again, in a manner that differs to many emperors, he wasn't a complete anti-Semite, <laughs> on uh, one occasion successfully protecting the Jews of Alexandria without provoking Egyptian nationalism. Uh, and in his later life, after his marriage with Messalina ended in 48 AD, after she conspired against him, he married his niece, Agrippina, and, which was an act contrary to Roman law, which he swiftly changed so he could do so. But the main consequence of this was he had to adopt her son, and her son was the infamous Emperor Nero. Claudius died on the 13th of October 54 AD in relatively suspicious circumstances, which has mostly been attributed to poisoning by Agrippina via mushrooms. Now, Claudius deserves a place on this list because of the amount of his successful conquests. He wasn't just successful in the West, in Britain, but also in the South, in Africa, the North, Germany, and the East, Syria. And he was one of the few emperors who was successful on all fronts, or ultimately, wherever he went. And he also acts as a pillar of sensibility between two completely insane emperors, which obviously helps his cause too. At number two, we have Emperor Augustus. Born the 23rd of September, 63 BC, died 19th of August 14 AD aged 75. His reign was from the 16th of January 27 BC to the 19th of Augustus 19th of August 14 AD. You'll see why I, I made that uh, little mistake there in a, in a couple of minutes. His reign was a, a solid 41 years 7 months. Augustus nearly doubled the size of the empire which he sort of inherited as the dregs of the Republic from his adopted father, Julius Caesar, um, and then subsequently yeah, took off his, uh, his mates. He added territories in Europe and Asia Minor, secured borders uh, against the barbarians in uh, Germany and uh, north of the Danube, um, and that he secured alliances and client states that gave him nominal rule from Britain to India. The Roman em he was the first Roman emperor and arguably the greatest. He he also named a month after himself, much like his uh, great uncle, predecessor, and adoptive father Julius Caesar. Augustus was born Octavius, and upon his adoption in forty four BC, became Octavian. And in twenty six BC, the Roman Senate conferred him the name Augustus. For simplicity's sake, the rest of the video will refer to him as Augustus. Augustus' military involvement came from an early age. When he was just 16, he went. He tried to go to Hispania to meet up with his uncle, uh, Caesar. On his way there, he was shipwrecked and uh, crossed enemy territory to reach his great uncle, an act that impressed Caesar enough to name Augustus as his heir and successor post posthumously. Caesar died a year later, aged and aged just 17, August had the support of the majority of the Senate, who rallied around him against their powerful enemy, Mark Antony. But after Augustus' troops defeated Antony's army in northern Italy, he refused an all-out pursuit of him and instead preferred an awkward alliance with his rival. In 43 BC, Augustus Antony and a man named Marcus Lepidus established the Second Triumvirate, a power-sharing agreement which divided up Rome's territories into areas of their nominal control. Antony was given land in the Roman East, Lepidus, Africa, and Augustus kept the West and Rome. Antony be began a romantic and political alliance with Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, and he still continued it despite a senatorial decree which forced his marriage to Augustus' sister Octavia Minor. Antony's affair continued, and in 32 BC, divorced Octavia. 
In retaliation, Augustus declared war upon Cleopatra, and at the naval battle of Actium a year later, under the command of his admiral, uh, also his personal general as well, a man named uh, Marcus Agrippa, Augustus had cornered and defeated Antony's ships. Cleopatra's navy raced to aid Antony's ships, but they both barely escaped. They returned to Egypt and committed a joint suicide and left Augustus as Rome's undisputed ruler. Seizing Cleopatra's treasure allowed him to pay soldiers, securing their loyalty, much like his great uncle's practice of paying the army, and to mollify the Senate, he passed laws hearkening back to the Roman Republic and to win over the citizens of Rome itself. He worked to improve the city itself. He spent the majority of his reign outside of Rome, consolidating his power in the empire's furthest reaches, implementing a system of taxation and censuses while doing so. He expanded the Roman network of roads, founded the Praetorian Guard and the Roman Postal Service. He also left Rome with both grand and practical gestures, including a new forum, a police force, or a policing force, and a fire department. Augustus died on the 19th of Augustus, 14 AD, and his last words are disputed, but both are just as epic as each other, perhaps lending to some ad with some artistic license over his final years. He either said, I found Rome of clay, and I leave it to you, of marble, or, he said, have I played the part well? Then applaud me as I exit. And this uh, adds greatly to the initial mytho-history of uh, the Roman emperors. No explanation is needed as to why Augustus deserves a place in this list. The Senate even declared him to be a god, he combined the military might, institutional reforms, and the lawmaking tra traditions of Rome, of the Roman Republic, sorry, and turned it into the Roman Empire, laying the foundations for the Pax, Pax Romana, Rom Roman peace, and an empire that lasted in one form or another for almost 1500 years after his death. Before we get to number one, here are some honourable mentions Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher emperor. Born 26th of April, 121 AD, died March 17th, 180 AD, age 58. He, his reign was from the 8th of March, 161 AD, to the 17th of March, 180 AD, 19 years in all. Upon Marcus Aurelius' ascension to the throne in 161 AD, his immediate call for action was over in the east, specifically with the Parthians, where he battled the Parthians for control over the eastern uh, Syrian realm of Rome. His brother Versus oversaw the Parthian War while Marcus stayed in Rome consolidating power. By the time the Parthian War had ended, another war had broken out after German tribes had crossed the Danube River in late 160s and had attacked a Roman city. Versus died in 169 AD, so Marcus fought on alone and drove the Germans back beyond the Danube. In 175, he faced another challenge to his authority, the very threat of a pretender to his seat. Avidius Cassius claimed the title of emperor after hearing a false rumour that Marcus was deathly ill. This forced Marcus east to regain control. But by the time he'd got there, Cassius had been murdered by his own soldiers. Instead, Marcus toured the eastern prov provinces with his wife Faustina, re-established his authority, but, she, but his wife Faustina unfortunately died during this trip. While once again battling German tribes, he made his son Commodus his co-ruler in 177 AD. Together they, th they fought right across the northern borders of the empire, and Marcus even wanted to extend the Roman limits, the borders. Unfortunately, he never lived long enough to do so. He died on March 17th, 180. Marcus Aurelius is not remembered for his military efforts, although they're certainly commendable. But for his contemplative nature, thus called the philosopher emperor in modern days, and uh, it, you can actually buy and read some of his works now. Uh, the Meditations are published uh, based upon his and extensions of Greek Stoic philosophy. The Meditations were a sort of masterwork of his. He completed through his nineteen years of his reign, and the majority of them concern personal notes and ideas to himself and his ideas on Stoic philosophy. It's just a like a, a basic Greek philosophy on personal ethics, logic, and like how the world works. The 12 books of the Meditations are still bestsellers and widely available in the world today. He's one of the few emperors whose reign is defined not by his military conquests, 
but by his reasonable methods of ruling and philosophies which have stood the test of time, and some of which are still relevant 2,000 years later. Another honourable mention I thought we'd include is the Emperor Diocletian, who reigned from 284 to 286 AD. So Diocletian is on this list because he stabilised the empire and marked the end of the 3rd century crisis. He reigned in the Eastern Empire while his co-ruler Maximian ruled in the West. He established the Tetrarchy, which was junior co-emperors who were named Augustus and Caesar after Augustus and Caesar, which meant that each emperor would rule over a quarter division of the empire. He also secured the empire's borders and purged all threats to its power, defeating the Samaritans, Carpi, Alamani, usurpers in Egypt and Sassanid Persians, sacking their capital, Sestiphon, in 299. He enlarged the empire's military and civil services, reorganised the empire's devisers and established the most bureaucratic government in the history of the empire. But on the 1st of May, 305, he abdicated, which is why I said his rule was actually 284 to 86. He abdicated, which was sort of the fashion of the older emperors, to look after, believe it or not, his cabbage patches over in modern-day Split in Croatia. Now, I ummed and ahed about this final honourable mention, but I thought we've included one, so we'll include the other. The one being Caligula, so we'll include Nero. He reigned from... AD 54 to 68. Why is he in? Because he was a complete nutcase. He killed his own mother, his stepbrother and two of his wives, arguably Rome's worst emperor. Brought Rome to the brink of collapse in less than 14 years. He was called the Antichrist because he persecuted Christians so badly and allegedly, i.e. he didn't, play the fiddle while Rome burned but it makes a nice story. This was during the Great Fire of Rome on the night of the 18th and 19th of July 64 AD. And his reign ended when he committed suicide, aged 30. And our final emperor, which if you haven't guessed already, I'm sure you will know now, number one is Julius Caesar. He was born on the 12th of July, 100 BC, died on the 15th of March, known as the Ides of March, 44 BC, aged 55, and he reigned from 49 to 44 BC. So, number one was always going to be Julius Caesar, wasn't it? He's the quintessential Roman emperor, and the first person who comes to mind, not just when someone mentions emperors, but when someone mentions ancient Rome, or even Rome. But, is this factually correct? Well, technically, Julius was never actually an emperor, because he didn't rule over an empire. He oversaw a republic, and he was technically a dictator. But no one's going to like this if we don't include Caesar and obviously deserves a place, so he's in. Caesar's life was non-stop from start to finish. So as a young man, he left Rome for military service in Asia and afterwards travelled to Rhodes for philosophical studies. But on his way to Rhodes, he was captured by pirates, but he convinced his captors to raise his ransom. He then organised a naval force, captured the pirates and put them to death. Under Pompey, he held a number of governmental positions and he was elected consul in 60 BC. The same year, Caesar, along with Crassus and Pompey, two Roman generals, formed the first triumvirate, a political alliance which dominated Roman politics for several years. So, a year later, in 59 BC, he became governor of Gaul and Spain, and during his tenure as governor, he took part in the Gallic Wars, 58-51 BC, which greatly extended Roman territory thanks to his victories. It was also during the 50s that he both invaded Britain and built a bridge across the Rhine River, which are still considered engineering masterpieces today. After Crassus's death at the Battle of Carhae in Parthia in 53 BC, Pompey realigned himself with the Senate, sensing that Caesar's support from the plebeians and his veteran army would threaten Pompey's position. With the conclusion of the Gallic Wars, the Senate ordered Caesar to step down from his military command and return to Rome. However, by leaving his command in Gaul, Caesar knew that he would be vulnerable to criminal prosecution by his enemies, and instead he openly defied the Senate's authority and crossed the Rubicon, and marched towards Rome as the head of an army. This triggered the beginning of Caesar's civil war, which he won, and ultimately left him in a position almost unchall- of almost unchallenged power and influence. Uh, Caesar also travelled to Egypt, just put this in his little anecdote, and involved himself in upholding the rule of Cleopatra, with whom he had a son, Caesarian, which is the Caesarian section, is named after today. After assuming control of government, Caesar began a programme of social and governmental reforms, including the creation of the Julian calendar, and naming the month of July after himself in the process. He also awarded citizenship to many members of the far-reaching stretches of the Roman Republic, while also initiating land reform and support for military veterans. 
He was eventually proclaimed dictator for life in 45 BC, but his populist and largely authoritarian reforms angered the elites who began to conspire against him. On the Ides of March, the 15th of March, which is actually my dad's birthday, Caesar was assassinated by a group of rebels within the Senate, led by Brutus and Cassius, who stabbed him to death, and some reports say that he was stabbed up to 23 times. Now, Caesar's death saw the onset of a series of civil wars, and the constitutional government of the Roman Republic was never restored fully. Caesar's great-nephew and adopted heir, Octavian, Augustus, who we mentioned just before, rose to sole power and saw over the transformation of the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Now, Caesar was a no-brainer for this list. Military successes, land reforms, governmental reforms, societal reforms, economic transformations, he had it all. Over 2,000 years after his death, he's still regarded as one of the greatest statesmen and military commanders in history, and his name Caesar has become synonymous with emperor. The title Caesar was used throughout the Roman Empire, as I mentioned under Diocletian before, and it's also given rise to modern adaptations, including Tsar, which is a Slavic or Russian interpretation of Caesar, and Kaiser, a Germanic interpretation of it. So thank you very much for listening. We hope you both enjoyed it. Thanks to Tom for coming on. Top man. Done a great job. And remember to like, comment, share and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks very much and I'll see you at the next one.